Um, so as I said, this is a sort of like medieval fantasy AU. Um, it is rated teen and up. It has a whole bunch of uh, relationships, actually a lot of like sibling relationships, which is cool to see. Um, also good, good for tagging that. That's awesome. Um, so we have a sibling relationship between the, the beta kids uh, and then John and Dave specifically. Uh, John and Roxy uh, friendship. Um, Dave, Dave Cat, I guess Pale Dave Cat. Uh, Dirk and Dirk. Oh, Dirk's bro and Dirk. Uh, Dad and the side, signless uh, Dave's bro and Dave. Uh, we got Dave Cat flushed. Uh, Dirk and Grandpa Harley. And saw and some some good old uh, aerosol. Our aerosol with an A, not with an with an E. Um, so this is a fantasy AU, medieval AU. This is the only dad in Signless, and also Dirk and Grandpa fix that exist. Yeah, I I, w w I I know the feeling of having written the only uh, the only fic in a tag, or the only of the only fix in the tag are yours. Um, I've got I've got a few that are in the hive swap tags that are I'm the only person who's written them, um, but we've I got one or like a, a pair that only I ship. <laughs> yeah, no, I've got um, the only person to have written uh, or at least to have tagged uh, Branya, Lanera, and Daria uh, polycule uh, fic is me. Um, <laughs> so we've got AU fantasy, AU medieval action adventure, action and adventure. Humor, elaborate fight sequences, slice of life, web serial, cooking monsters, canon typical violence, magic weapons, epic bromance, found family. It's a little like Dungeon Mishi. It's also a little, a little like Monster Hunter, non-binary character, uh, alcohol, fantasy drugs, ribald humor. This means sex is referenced, but in a humorous medieval fashion during conversation. Marijuana, banter, implied in reference child abuse, military training, blood and injury, and blood. Um... So this is this is this is some good stuff. Uh, the Four Thrones, or a knight errant, a naive squire, a brusque tinkress, and a snarky wizard walk into a bar, start a bar fight, proceed to get kicked out, and then accidentally top roll the burgeoning empire of a corrupt politician or two before going on a vacation with some monster slaying, featuring literally as many Homestuck characters as I can fit in. Um, and it's been updating uh, pretty regularly. So book one, the Runaway Knight. Uh, take it away, Dave. <clears throat> Oi, Tosspot, Egbert. The knight errant yelled, stretching a hand up into the horizon with the dipping sun behind it, like a halo on a finger, puppet for children, perfectly befitting the sort of strange week John had been having. The week, of course, as you may know, dear reader, was begun by an attempt at a drinking contest rebuffed by the fact that, as a 19-year-old, John Egbert did not find it appropriate to drink. It wasn't as if Sir David E. Strider, knighted by Her Excellency of Durst herself, also 19, found this a particularly compelling excuse. But a person had their reasons, and he would respect that. That's not very nice. John replied, sucking their cheek between their teeth in the show of disapproval. They pursed their lips up and made a silly face in the general direction of Sir Strider, who flipped them the Queen's Eagle. A complex hand gesture involving your thumb, middle finger, and pinky extended towards the head. It was a very rude thing to do, especially to someone you had spent a week challenging to various forms of bargain. When one looked at Sir Strider, the thought of such a man being knighted by it, much less making anything of himself seemed vanishingly unlikely. He was the scrawny beanpole of a human being, with a carnal red hair hidden under a thorough layer of brick a more thorough layer of rust cheap looking plate, and then a final coif threaded over his shoulders. More striking, of course, was perhaps the one thing he had known for. A massive greatsword that, if intact, would easily be the kind of blade used to split both a horse and its rider in a singly deadly strike. If intact. It was, in fact, snapped cleanly in half through some method that Sir Strider spun a, a separate yarn for whenever passed, no matter how frequent or fervently he was pushed for information regarding the clean cut splitting his blade in twain, he would never give you a straight answer. But when you saw it in combat, you soon stopped doubting whether or not 
such a man was worth the reputation he earned as one of the fastest hands in dirt. And with those fast hands, half blades strapped to his back, he kicked at the dusty ground of the little mountain village he had ventured all this way to best knight Egbert at. When the drinking contest went through, an arm wrestling contest was held. John won, handily. Then a game of checkers. Dave, then a boar slaying contest. John, and finally, a drinking contest of water, which Dave, in fact, would win. Starting, startling most onlookers who knew John in a voracious appetite and thirst, particularly for a good glug of spring water. They left the record 2-2 when Sir Strider decided it was time to move on from this quiet little hamlet and on to greener pastures. His purse grew empty and his stomach light, which meant that it was time to go somewhere more populous and stride the bounty towards for some time. It's been a very fun time, truly. Sir Strider said, with an indeterminate amount of sincerity, as Knight Egbert approached, war pick in hand. Unlike Sir Strider, John looked more readily built for combat, with shiny new plate mail, inherited from their father, a broad stance perfect for striking, inherited from their father, an intricately smith war pick, inherited from their father, and a general knightly aura of valor also inherited from their father. Father Egbert, the literal, was the court paladin of Crossfit for quite some time until his unlikely demise at the hands of Becquerel Black, a lupine brigand of some renown, still at large. John, the ever-prodigal child, tempered with their desires for vengeance with an even hand, despite the urging of their fellows. By today, the trail of Becquerel Black had gone bone cold. And that was okay. John had a life to live. Ir irrespective of the lack of respect they received by from those who considered themselves the compatriots of John's father. But duty, duty does, in her ever encroaching orgy, call. I have my life, and you have yours. Fare thee well. Sir Strider's voice had an air of unrecognizable melancholy about it, and John, behind their ruffled hair in short, messy spikes, didn't quite recognize the need for the tone. As far as John was concerned, Sir Strider had undoubtedly despised them, as was evident in every motion that and request to prove himself against John's skills. Just another wastrel looking to compare themselves to the child of Father Egbert to see if they could best the inheritor of the prosperity and will. And they could, somewhat frequently, and they could not, just almost as frequently. In her what? Ever encroaching orgy, you know? Actually, let's just pretend I didn't say that. I've called a wagon. They should be arriving before nightfall. And assuming you stay here, or do not follow directly, this will likely be the last we see of each other. It was a pleasure to meet you, in some regard. Sir Strider answered, taking a couple of steps backward until he was technically out of the bounds of the village, and sitting down on the firm dirt and thin, narrow grasses of the mountainous region. John sat down next to him. And you plan on waiting by your lonesome, Sir Strider? That seems awfully ill-advised of you. There could be bandits out here in the woods. Or worse, wolves. Sir Strider rolled his neck and head in a way indicative of rolling his eyes. Although it was difficult to see through his narrow meadow visor clamped firmly over his actual peepers, revealing only his mouth and lower half of his nose, alongside the off-orange scruff that passed for his beard. I will plant my butt here and wait until the wagon arrives, and not spend a minute more in this accursed town. Nor will I burn my eyes any further with its hoary inhabitants. It's what? Sir Strider, I believe you're mistaken. The brothel? John interrupted, actually for real kind of concern this time, as opposed to the fake concern they typically used when messing with people. Hari, Knight Eckbert. H-O-A-R-Y. 
Sir Strider explained, starting his sentence off like he was about to hawk a loogie. It means white, old, wizened, wrinkly, the hoary people of this village with no energy, verve, or drive. What was that? That that thing you did? H-O-A-R-Y? What was that? John asks, derailing the conversation yet again with their legitimate curiosity and slight concern for Sir Strider's mental state. Spelling? Sir Strider asked incredulously. Excuse me, Knight Egbert. I mean not to offend, but are you illiterate? Yes! Janiah? Yes! I said the line. I don't think it picked up. Well, you didn't hear it. Everyone oh, okay. on, on stream would have. <laughs> oh, sorry. John replied, grinning smugly. Sir Strider reached up to mime, pinching the bridge of his nose, only succeeding in dragging the flats of his fingers across his metal visor, his nails making an unseemly scraping noise against the rusted metal material. I spent my childhood days learning the way of the sword, the hammer, the warpick, the axe, the brazier, and the gauntlet. Holy magic, which I failed to absorb. We didn't have time for books. That sort of thing was left for the scholars. Did you have time for books? Sir Strider tilted his head in John's general direction, as a nonverbal way of indicating confusion. John tilted their head back, clearly confused. You never learned how to read? Sir Strider asked, in blunt disbelief. No, is that an issue? Can we not be friends if I'm not capable of reading your erotic poetry, Sir Strider? John asked, clearly under the mistaken impression for some reason that Sir Strider was a fan of theirs. He was quick to disabuse that notion. No, we cannot, I'm afraid. Only individuals with sufficient literacy to consume my most tasteful mountains of erotic poetry are fit to become my friends, Knight Egbert. I'm afraid you are simply not fit to task. We'll have to remain as bitter enemies, forever embroiled in the most painful of personal holy wars as we- Okay, so can you teach me? John interrupted. Whip quick. Please stop interrupting my soliloquies, Knight Egbert. Sir Strider biffly retorted. I don't know what a soliloquy is. Can you teach me? John repeated, clearly not taking anything other than a straight yes or no as an answer. To be fair to them, however, this was because anything besides yes, no, or potentially, depending on their insistence, maybe, was, to them, not an answer. Both how to read and what a soliloquy is. You seem like an intel intelligent individual, Sir Strider, with wit nearly as sharp as your blade. Hey. I would like to be taught these basic skills that I have clearly lacked in the proper education to learn. Assuredly, a skillful knight such as yourself is up to the task. Sir Strider sighed. I've only paid enough coin to transport me and my luggage. Plus, I have no use of another mouth to feed on my travels. While I'd love to catch you up on all the finer things in life that your sheltered suburban tutelage withheld from you, I simply do not have the resources available to me. Sir Strider said, internally unable to decide whether he actually wanted to take Knight Egbert under his tutorship or not. It was a slightly tempting idea to be known as the one who taught the son of Father Egbert everything they knew about the arts, performance, humor, gestureship. But on the other hand, it would require putting up with Knight Egbert for even more time. And Sir Strider was not so much a louse as to leave a sentient being, even one in distaste, in the wilderness. Ah, oh, that's okay. I'll try to pay for myself. I have the coin. John offered, reaching into a pocket and withdrawing a small cloth sack, jingling with currency. Prospit and lucre. I'm sure of the exchange rate to your Dursite coinage, but it should be enough for the wagon operator. Plus, I've seen your hand in combat. And I believe we may be able to make mutual usage of each other. Mutual usage? Sure, Strider replied. Slow, ever slower, drawing out each word, and John's face filled with blush, shaking their head vigorously. No, 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 not in that fashion. 
I am not the kind of fancy man, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on the asker. John frantically replied, waving their hands around in the air like a panicked child. The kinds of flailing about that actually will leave whatever it means to you, dear reader. Sir Strider quickened an eyebrow, albeit one aware of its invisibility behind steel eyes and dice. Assuredly. John looked away, coughing twice, loudly, to clear the air. Assuredly, but I digress. While I would certainly enjoy your company and make well use of your intellect in teaching me how to read, write, perform the skills of basic literacy, etc., I actually am not a leech in this arrangement. Or, at least, I would not wish myself one. Sir Strider leaned back, resting his palms on the ground. By now, the sun, already low in her flight, was beginning to descend below the horizon. A steadily sinking egg rotting in the sky, painting the auras a pale green, bright red, intermingling colors of gods and goddesses in the sky above. Then, in an instant, with both knights watching closely, they vanished. The minute of intermingling between the mortal and divine realms per week thus ceased, leaving the sky in starless orange, rapidly fading to black. It was, as far as sunsets went, a very pretty sunset. Right, and what will you be doing for me that makes this arrangement a fair, equitable one? I am no usurer, mind, nor do I desire to become one. I find the field infinitely detestable. For the presence of accursed mathematics that confounds the brain and stymies the senses, I intensely dislike mathematics. Sir Strider responded. After enough time had passed that he could see the wagon slowly approaching in the distance. Until then, it was quiet silence neither of them willing to say anything to break the wall of emptiness that had sprung between the two. I digress. Sir Strider slowly rose to his feet, dusting off spare bits of gravel and stone from his rear end, his legs, and his palms. I want to make something of myself. Beyond the child of Father Egbert, in peace may his spirit rest. John began, staring into the distance, eyes furrowed, eyes narrowed. They grabbed their war pick and pointed it towards the deepening horizon, a challenge to the heavens, and the pendulous divinities they carried, strange carapace under the watchful eye of Egbert. There are monsters to be slain, vengeance to be explored, bounties to be drawn. I am John Egbert, and I wish to be the child of Father Egbert no longer. Sir Strider chuckled at the little speech. Oh, how he hated the simple movement of it. The way that John's passion rings so clearly in their every sentence and motion. There was no training for acting that could produce this kind of emotion. The pure sincerity of an individual who had never learned how to lie or hide themselves from the world outside of them. Sir Strider could feel every ounce of truth in John's words and laughed, reaching up to clasp his helmet in one hand and his guffawing echoed through the mountainsides. John looked hurt letting their war pick drift down to the ground, pointed tip dragging a small line into the dirt. Well, I, I suppose it was worth a shot. Fare thee well, sir. John began, turning around mid-sentence. This time, however, it was their turn to be interrupted, with a hand clasped over their shoulder plates. Egbert, Knight Egbert, you wish to be an adventurer, a vagrant adventurer. Sir Strider asked turning to John around with a firm grip, the other hand resting on their sword. Living under the stars or in inns, never staying home, always searching for danger to be conquered, maidens to be saved, treasure to be gathered, that is the path you wish to take in your life? John nodded twice. More than anything else, Sir Strider. The other knight reached his hand to John. I'll accept your offer. My life is one of humdrum expertise. Perhaps carrying a companion in combat will add some spice to my days and nights. He roared, his voice increasing in volume to a boisterous crescendo. John, grinning wide, clasped their hand against Dave's, giving it a rough, firm shake. Let's provide the spice then, yeah! Yeah. Alright, nice. That's really yeah. good. Yeah, like that. Nice job, Seeps. That, uh, that was a good story. I'm 
Yeah, it was read, very fun to read some there. more of it. <laughs> It was really good. I am there is 33 chapters. That. Yeah, it, well, 33 chapters, and it is still ongoing because 33 chapters is the end of volume one. 